HRN's 2022 holiday auction is full of the most delicious presents you can't get anywhere else, including unforgettable experiences for every food lover. Be the best gift giver of the season. Bid on a book party with award-winning author and caterer to the stars, Mary Giuliani. Or a spectacular fermentation class for you and friends with cookbook author and HRN host, Harry Rosenblum. Or maybe home cooking classes from the iconic Zingerman's Bakehouse. When you bid at HRN's 2022 holiday auction, not only are you one step closer to becoming the best gift giver of the season, but you're also supporting our mission to build a more equitable, sustainable, and delicious world. Register now at heritageradionetwork.org and give the holidays most delicious gifts. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. Since 2009, HRN podcasts have been exploring the wide world of food, beverage, and agriculture. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. It is France. It will be some can-can on the Champs-Élysées tonight. France are the champions of the world. World Cup. It's the largest, flashiest sporting event of the year. Or, you know, every fourth year. And a little over a decade ago, it was announced that the 2022 FIFA Men's World Cup would be hosted in the Middle East for the first time. The winner to organize the 2022 FIFA World Cup is Qatar. This year's event kicked off on November 20th in Doha, Qatar. Typically, the World Cup is a global celebration of sport, uniting each nation in support of a common goal, to be world champion. Now, host nation Qatar is a loaded phrase. Shortly after the World Cup was awarded here, allegations of corruption surfaced that FIFA officials had taken bribes to vote in favor of Qatar's bid, something that FIFA and Qatari officials deny. The country's human rights record also under intense scrutiny, particularly on women's rights and on migrant labor practices. And homosexuality here is illegal. The preparations to hold the event in Qatar, a country the size of Connecticut, included a complete reformation of Qatari infrastructure built on the backs of migrant workers living in the country with few labor protections. This overhaul included the Qatari food system. They needed to increase food production and expand water reserves to accommodate an excess 1.2 million people expected to enter the country. Inherent in this year's competition is a paradox. FIFA, their sponsors, and the host government will make massive revenues, even on food and drink alone, while the event could never have happened without the exploitation of migrant labor. This week, with the World Cup now in full swing, we're looking at the relationship between food and sports. Food fuels athletes' performance. It's consumed by hordes of spectators and can even be a sport itself. From the current World Cup to adventures on the high seas, we explore how food and competition have paired together throughout history. I'm Matt Patterson, and this is Meat and Three on HRN. Meat and Three. Meat and Three. Meat and Three. One meat, three sides. Food, news, and storytelling. A square meal for your ears. Meat and Three. In the lead-up to this year's World Cup, there was a lot of speculation about how the event would handle alcohol. For months, FIFA and the Qatari government have attempted to find an agreement that would honor the governing body's multi-million dollar partnership with Budweiser and the country's strict restrictions on drinking. That compromise imploded just two days before the start of the competition when, on November 18th, FIFA announced the removal of all beer sales from the World Cup. Aviva Futornik digs into the ill-fated arrangement and why our love for drinking alcohol during sporting events is so strong in the first place. So there's just a few places that they allow beer, to sell beer over here in Qatar. And it's- the FIFA Fan Festival 
those were Ecuadorian fans in Doha, cheering for beer after their 2-0 win against Qatar to open the competition. In Qatar, an Islamic country, alcohol sale and consumption is greatly restricted. Alcohol is only available at licensed hotels and restaurants or with a permit at the Qatar distribution company's single liquor store. Drinking in public is illegal. These laws exist in the backdrop of a sport known for free-flowing liquor among spectators and millions of dollars tied to alcohol sponsorships. In September, organizers initially announced a plan for serving Budweiser beer, the World Cup's exclusive beer brand. They're creating this special space for fans who are largely coming from uh, non-Middle Eastern countries to attend the event, can go and experience the event that they had hoped would be there and potentially not be found uh, disobeying some of these very restrictive laws. My name is Dr. Sarah G, and I'm an associate professor at the University of Windsor in the Faculty of Human Kinetics Department of Kinesiology. As Sarah says, beer would have been available within the eight stadium perimeters before and after matches and in the evenings at the official FIFA Fan Festival in Doha. Instead, With mounting pressure from the Qatari government, only Bud Zero, Budweiser's non-alcoholic option, can be sold at the stadiums, while beer at the fan festival is still available. For fans and sponsors alike, this change is a bit of a shock. Budweiser's parent company, Anheuser-Busch InBev, paid FIFA $75 million for the World Cup beer rights. Yet, just two days before the event, their flagship product was banned. I think the sponsors have a very key role in some of these things, all the way back to... When a country or a city bids to host some of these sport mega events, the sponsors are very much considered in the ways that how are we going to have this event in this location and still ensure that our sponsors are seen, uh, have their pride of place, and get their money's worth. From the moment Qatar won the hosting bid in 2012, the country and FIFA struggled to balance the existing alcohol restrictions with the financial commitment to the alcohol sponsors. It's not just that fans are likely to crave a pint during a match, it's that breweries are often the biggest sponsor of major sporting events. And their product is everywhere. The sudden ban of alcohol sales may cause a significant rift between FIFA and their sponsors. But as fans, what do we expect from sports? And how intertwined is alcohol consumption? Why is alcohol so widely consumed at sporting events? I think the simple answer is that it always has been. Going back to Greek times and even further back, whenever a sporting event was held, by and large, it's been accompanied by drinking. It's one of the the great laws of human leisure time, that whenever sports played, people want to drink alcohol. My name is Tony Collins. I'm Professor of History at De Montfort University in Leicester in England. Tony is the author of Mud, Sweat and Beers, A Cultural History of Sport and Alcohol. According to him... Drinking alcohol during sporting events is promoted by both the viewer and the sponsorship company. That link between sports and alcohol exists both at the personal level of, you know, let's go down to the match and and have a few beers. And I think that's the case, you know, whether you're watching soccer, American football, baseball, cricket or, or whatever. And also it exists at the economic level that without the financial support of breweries, without the sponsorship of breweries, then sport would be diminished and it wouldn't exist in the way that we know it today. I asked Tony how sports would be affected if, like this year, alcohol was completely banned from matches. The FIFA World Cup is such an important event in world sport today, such a massive global TV mega event that I don't think the attendances would be impacted if alcohol was completely banned because people always want to go and see the FIFA World Cup. However, if that became a common thing, if it was banned at all football matches, then I think that there might be an issue uh, and that the experience of being a fan would, would start to change and people would perhaps think differently about their reasons for going to a match. In many Muslim countries, alcohol is not widely available and sometimes illegal. In Qatar, concerns that a prominent and extended presence of alcohol would unsettle the population and potentially incite a security problem drove the beer ban. When future sporting events occur in a Muslim country, will their culture, or will money, take precedent? In the lead-up to the 2014 World Cup, FIFA successfully lobbied the Brazilian government to suspend their ban of sales of alcoholic beverages in stadiums during the tournament. AB InBev estimates that the beer industry volumes grew by 4.3% in Latin America North that year. 
So by having a sporting event in these locations, they get their brands there, they get some exposure to their brand, and they get the hype around the event associated uh, with their brand as well. So it's really not just a surface level sort of arrangement, but there are some sort of deeper meanings and complexities behind, you know, why alcohol companies decide to choose to uh, sponsor some of these events. And it's really coming down to this notion of they need more people to consume their product. And in, in these particular cases, it's finding a new market of, of consumers. The complicated case of alcohol sales in this year's World Cup highlights the notion that despite cultural norms or public interest, the money is most important. And the money is in alcohol. For many fans, a beer or two while watching sports is a normal, ingrained part of their routine. For sponsors, that beer or two among millions of people sustains their profits and encourages further sponsorship of sporting events. Aviva just gave us one example of how sports fans often have expectations around specific concessions at sporting events. Few food pairings are as strongly associated with a specific competition as the bowls of strawberries and cream served each year at Wimbledon. In our next story, Vaidehi Kudyati asks how this tradition came to be and explores how both the event and the dish came to signify Britishness itself. In his 2010 autobiography, Chris Goring, who was the chief executive of Wimbledon for 26 years, noted that the games were tennis in an English garden. While some might argue that Goring's observations were hyperbole, there is no denying that there are only a few things in the world that can be Britishness, or a specific kind of Britishness, like the Wimbledon games do. The two-week-long summer tournament embodies every quintessential British tradition from strictly followed dress codes to impeccably well-maintained courts. The food and drinks served at one of the most popular games in the world also carry meanings about identity and heritage in British society. Despite being introduced as a food option at Wimbledon only a few decades ago in the 1970s, strawberries and cream quickly became a staple delicacy at the games. Consequently, it became a symbol of summertime sports in England. Today, Wimbledon sources close to 38.4 tons of strawberries from local British growers every year for the tournament. That's close to 1.92 million hand-picked strawberries. And close to 10,000 litres of cream make their way to the All England Tennis Club to go with the fresh fruit. But how did strawberries and cream become such a popular dish? And what meaning does it convey? While it is unclear how strawberries and cream really made their way into Wimbledon's menu, the most widely accepted account places the genesis of the dish in the 16th century royal court of Henry VIII. Accounts note that Thomas Woosley, who was a powerful figure in the court, served the dish at a banquet and set it up for success. Subsequently, the dish found its way into tennis matches held at Woosley's estate. In the early 1900s, King George V is said to have introduced a dish to the menu at the Wimbledon Games, making eating strawberries and cream both fashionable and a royal treat associated with the summertime games. This account solidifies strawberries and cream's place within a long shared history in British culture. It is no surprise then that the dish is now a part of a food culture that is representative of a kind of national identity and shared heritage. According to scholar Devyani Prabhat, eating strawberries and cream at Wimbledon is an act full of meaning. In conjunction with other acts such as drinking tea and playing cricket, eating strawberries and cream is a way to be British and as a result, belong in society. In other words, Devyani knows that this act is a way to capture the meaning of nationhood. For often excluded groups such as migrant citizens, to belong is to adopt British values, such as eating strawberries and cream at tennis games, and consequently, be British. We'll be right back with more Meat and Three after a brief break. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Roberta's was founded in Bushwick in 2008 and has become one of the most iconic restaurants in the country. 
HRN made its home inside of Roberta's in 2009, and together they have become part of the DIY fabric of the neighborhood. Roberta's, the pizza restaurant, is open for lunch and dinner seven days a week and serves much more than just the famous wood-fired pizzas. Their team dreams up new salads, pastas, and sandwiches on the regular. Roberta's Tiki Bar is alive and well in the back garden, serving up frozen drinks in the summer and hot toddies in the winter. Stop by the bakery and takeout spot next door for fresh breads, sticky buns, and pizzas to go. And of course, there's the two Michelin-starred Blanca tucked away in the garden for truly daring diners. But Roberta's also extends beyond Bushwick, with multiple locations in New York City and now in Los Angeles. You can also find their frozen pies in grocery stores around the country. The spirit of Roberta's, like Heritage Radio Network, is everywhere. Here's to many more years of pizza-powered radio. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. Welcome back to Meet N3. While the catalyst for this episode was the current competition in Qatar, for our next story, Stella Maiden takes us way back in time to the culinary contests of the medieval Arab world. Ready, set, cook. It is possible that these very words, or ones similar to it, were uttered in 10th century Iraq, roughly a thousand years before shows like Iron Chef, Chopped, and The Great British Bake Off were even pitched. Although cooking as sport may seem like a recent phenomenon, cooks have long been battling it out in the kitchen. In medieval Iraq, cooking itself was not a chore exclusively done by servants. Many caliphs knew how to cook and even wrote their own cookbooks. To understand this history, I spoke with Nawal Nasrallah, an independent food historian, cookbook writer, and translator of early Iraqi cookbooks. One of the caliphs, on a spur of the moment, suggested that why don't we all cook dishes and we see who is cooking is best. So they started cooking and they asked the servant to go outside and pick up the first person he sees walking on the street and bring him in so that he'll be the judge. So that was how they did it. But competition was not exclusive to the kitchen. It found its way to the dining table, too. I mean, we talk about cooking contests, but there were also eating contests, like we have (laughs) in America, like sausage eating contests or something. So, uh, I mean, I also came the the story uh, that was in Egypt, not in Baghdad. In the uh, 10th century, during the Fatimid period, is that when they used to have their uh, grand feasts, you know, of course, for the elites, for the sultan, at the end, they used to entertain the guests with songs, uh, dancing, and also eating contests. Uh, They would choose two soldiers, and they would uh, put in front of them a whole lamb, uh, grilled, 10 cooked chickens, and uh, a huge platter filled with uh, dessert, and they would see who would, who's, I mean, who would eat it faster than the other. So <laughs> there are two kinds of, uh, of contests. Although food competitions may seem a world away from anything as regimented as religion, faith played a large part in how food was consumed. What makes this also, you know, quite acceptable at the time is that Islam did not prohibit enjoyment of food. You know, not like Christianity where gluttony is like a sin. Um, Muslims were encouraged to enjoy the bounties of God, but of course not in excess. You know, gluttony was also uh, uh, frowned upon. That's why they found it it was okay to enjoy food in this way, and it encouraged all kinds of uh, activities. So what exactly is our centuries-long obsession with duking it out over the dinner table? One word, entertainment. (laughs) Entertainment, that's the appeal. And enjoy a good uh, dish after the, after the contest is done. Whether you're competing yourself or are more comfortable simply watching from the sidelines, you're participating in the long-running tradition of turning food into sport. A soccer game or a tennis match are over in a matter of hours. But in the world of long-distance sailing, events like the Volvo Ocean Race and the Vendee Globe require competitors to spend months traversing the ocean. For our last story, Rana Rudy speaks with a sailor who is currently undertaking a weeks-long journey to find out how his crew sustains themselves at sea. Imagine cooking your usual lunch, but with just a little change. 
Your kitchen, the floor you're standing on, and the stovetop you cook on, all of it is tilted 80 degrees to the right. This, as my friend Thomas Kuell explained to me, is what cooking while sailing across the sea can be like. I remember like a few years ago, I was like cooking with my friend and we were kind of walking on the walls while cooking because the boat was so tilted that we were seeing the, the deep ocean on like the side hatch of the boat and we were able to walk on the walls while cooking because the boat was so tilted. But at the end, it's it's funny and and it's cool because you are cooking in a different environment uh, as a still kitchen in your house or in your flat. So you're kind of taking that in consideration. And when you bring up the meal, people are not expecting like crazy food because it's a rough condition when you're in the kitchen and you're trying to cut a tomato and the tomato is just flying away. I spoke with Thomas as he was preparing for a major voyage across the Atlantic Ocean. He and his six sailing mates will set out on his grandfather's sailboat to cross from the Canary Islands off the coast of Africa to the island of Antigua in the Caribbean, a journey that will take them almost three weeks. During that time, they will have absolutely no access to land, meaning no access to food, water, other people or resources outside of those on their sailboat. I wanted to know exactly what goes into preparing for a journey like this and what the logistics are of cooking while sailing at high, unpredictable seas. First, I was curious to know, how do they prepare enough food for six people for three weeks? It's a full crossing, so we have to buy a lot of water bowls, about one liter and a half per person per day. And then we have a water maker where we can do water and uh and prepare food also for that and try to fish as much fish as we can every day to sustain our our food for the whole trip we really want to fish a lot and during the crossing you can fish like wahoo tunas and mahi mahi so we really are hoping to catch a fish a day to be able to feed all the crew In addition to fishing, Thomas and his friends have prepared huge mason jars full of ready-to-make foods like curry or beef ragu that can easily be reheated in water. This is essential during especially rocky seas. No matter the conditions, though, the sailboat is designed to handle the waves and the kitchen is no different, decked out with a stovetop that actually swings with the movements of the waves to avoid spillage. The kitchen is, of course, static, but wherever we cook stuff moves with the waves so we can always cook something reheat something because it will always move so like hot water will not burn us because the the whole part of it will move with with the waves so that's really really important but yeah if it's wavy and all that you have to use a hand for holding to hold yourself and a user hand to cook so it's one hand for you, one hand for the cooking, because if you let go of one of your hands that's holding you, you fall. So uh, it's it can be tricky and messy, but personally, I really find this really funny and interesting because it's just uh, part of the adventure, you know. When conditions are rough and you've been at sea for several days, the only comfort you may have is your bed and the food. And I heard a lot of stories of people being angry and mad at others because of the water or the food. And one of the main problems on big crossing is is like your personal comfort and then you become sort of a an animal and you wanna you wanna survive. So you like hiding food, hiding water and all that. So The food needs to be good and you need to enjoy what you're eating because then you can have tension and problems actually after that. And so if you can pull out a nice meal while it's like the storm out there, people will be happy and they will be maybe in a better mood. 
Whether it's the sport of surviving at sea for three weeks with nothing but your own resources, or the challenge of whipping up a meal in the chaos of a tilted kitchen, it is clear that there is much adventure to be discovered both on top and below the surface of a sailboat. Learn more about the guests and topics we touch on this week by checking out our show notes. Special thanks this week to Aviva Futornik, Vaidehi Kudyati, Stella Maiden, and Rana Rudy. Meet N3 is produced by Kevin Chang Barnum, Katie Moseman Wadler, and me, Matt Patterson. Our theme song was composed by Breakmaster Cylinder. This program is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. Meet and 3 is powered by Simplecast. Meet and 3 is a production of Heritage Radio Network, the world's pioneer food radio station. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org and follow us at heritage underscore radio. And please stay in touch. Whether you have a story idea or would just like to say hey, write us at ideas at meetand3.nyc. That's all spelled out.